The rule of law, the foundation of a free and fair society where access to justice is available to all. It underpins our constitution and is what drives and unifies our 10,600 employees across 150 countries worldwide at LexisNexis. Enabling the way corporate, legal and government professionals do business. Making it possible for them to shape the world we live in for a better future. A leading legal technology organization with more than 85 years experience in the South African legal landscape, we empower legal practitioners with access to the latest precedents, expert curated content and solutions to drive the wheels of justice in our country. Using artificial intelligence technologies such as data analytics, natural language processing and machine learning, we are reshaping the way legal professionals work. We offer governance, risk and compliance software solutions that assist corporate professionals in proactively identifying and managing areas that could potentially impact their business and help human resource practitioners appoint the right people with the right qualifications to drive a profitable future. We play our part in making it possible for individuals to become the rightful owners of their first homes. Bringing the property ecosystem together by harnessing the power of technology. We get it right so that our customers can get it right. We are advancing the practice of law, the compliance with law and the upholding of the rule of law. Because at LexisNexis, we are advancing what's possible. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. I am Melanie Romalio from uh, LexisNexis South Africa. I am the Sales and Marketing Director. And I want to welcome all the attendees to this session. Welcome our speaker, Nicola Komnenos, and also just welcome everybody from the risk community as well that has joined us via the OMSA invitation this morning. This session follows the launch in February of the OMSA Risk Report, South Africa Risks 2021, which LexisNexis was proud to be a partner and brand sponsor of. The OMSA Risk Report, as always, is a compelling blueprint and a call to action for leaders in both the public and private sectors. And today, we're taking another call to action by having this session. So welcome and thank you for joining us. This latest report is particularly important given the impact of COVID-19 and the manner in which it has compounded ongoing volatile scenarios and global risk impacts. COVID-19 has demonstrated in no uncertain terms that every one of us, individual, organization, and country is much more integrated into the global system than we previously thought. And we all need to collectively manage current and emerging risks as corporate governance and communities. Those who have interrogated the, the report will have noted that the top three risks in the report identified for South Africa relate to serious issues of leadership, governance failures and corruption. OMSA's position is that if we do not actively, purposely and constructively start doing the actual things that will shape our future, as a risk, intelligent and resilient society, we have very little chance of having a future to influence. In today's session, we will be looking specifically at the key risk of continuing private and public governance failure and what we as the business sector can do to safeguard against the threats of corporate and country failure. Closely related to this is the top risk noted in the report that of a scarcity of unified, ethical, and visionary leadership. To share insights and practical tips around how we as corporates can work to address and mitigate against governance related corporate and country failure, we are very honored to have with us Nicola Komnenos, Group Chief Risk Officer of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, who will address us shortly. 
Nicola is obviously a leader in risk and governance and business management. And it's wonderful to be able to harness her expertise today for this session. I, like I'm sure many of you, listened virtually to Nicola when Elsa launched its report in February 2021, as she was questioned by Jeremy. And I was intrigued by her insights around structural inequality in South Africa and how critical strong leadership and good governance are within this context. Today's session will be an interactive one. There will be an opportunity to have a robust conversation and to send through any questions you would like Nicola to address specifically. We encourage questions and comments from attendees. Please post these in the chat session, which I'm sure all of you know, and you will also be given an opportunity to ask specific questions during the Q&A agenda item. So please use the chat at the bottom or the Q&A, and we will address them during this hour. Just before we hear from Nicola, I would like to share some brief extracts from the OMSA risk report on the topic of private and public governance failures. It states, ineffective governing bodies contribute to governance failures and even to corporate and country failure. A well-governed country, institutions and organizations are essential for the economy to thrive, to meet the country's fiscal needs, to build resilience and to secure the hopes of future generations. The report says that in order to address and recover from all of the risks outlined, we need a risk intelligent public and private sector where leaders at the highest levels embrace an enterprise wide culture of integrated risk management to secure South Africa's future through robust risk informed decision making. So what does this continuing private and public governance failure mean for risk and compliance professionals, we ask, and how can we as corporate South Africa address the scarcity of the very needed unified ethical and visionary leadership, we ask. To help us unpack these issues, it gives me great pleasure to formally introduce Nicola Komninos. Nicola will provide some practical know-hows and tips on how to, to be proactive and give us some answers to these questions from her perspective to create a resilient and sustainable organization. Nicola is a CFA, charter holder, and currently the group CRO of the JSE. She is the 2020 recipient of the Covetous Ermsa Risk Manager Award. She chairs the JSE Pension Fund Board and CFA SA Society Risk Governance and Audit Committee. Nicola co-heads the Women in ETFs South Africa's chapter. Nicola participates in various industry committees, including the World Federation of Exchanges Risk Working Group, the Saab Financial Sector Continuum, Contingency Forum and UMSA Risk Intelligence Committee. With over 15 years of experience in financial markets, her previous roles include the MD of Nautilus Group, a hedge fund platform, and head of various functions, including group strategy, sustainability, equities, and the equity derivative and business intelligence. Previously, industry roles include investment consulting and life investment management, investment product product development, and her qualifications include BCom Honours and BCom Investment Management degrees, both cum laude. Nicola is also passionate about mentorship and sharing her knowledge and experience. Welcome and over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, it's really great to be here. And, and I think, first of all, just shout out to the team and, and thank you for the invite. Um, really an honor to be a guest speaker today, uh, and I hope we can all share some great insights and, and together jointly design some of those solutions that could help um, further the agenda in South Africa. I think it really is quite a heavy topic, I have to admit, for a Wednesday morning, so I hope you've, you've had your cup of coffee um, and you're ready for, for a very engaging conversation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I've got a, a presentation that I wanted to uh, just take you through just a couple of slides, um, extracting some information from the IRMSA 2021 risk report, uh, specifically focusing obviously on the elements that we're discussing today, which is the continuing private and public governance failures. Um, and even though I've got the content in here um, and uh, I'm happy to share that, I, I really do encourage you to please 
uh, ask questions, make it as engaging as possible, um, make any notes uh, if you'd like to at this point in time or, or write, write down your questions if you want to ask it later. Um, but let's make sure we share ideas. I think none of us hold the silver bullet. Um, unfortunately, is a systemic issue in South Africa and in most emerging markets across the globe, uh, even in other developed markets uh, internationally. So this really is not a uniquely South African issue. Uh, and there's some great examples globally of how we can learn how different governments, how different uh, private sector institutions have dealt with these issues. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a CFA charter holder, so certainly rooting out corruption and ensuring governance failures is one of our top priorities. Um, and you can imagine with what's happened in the in the public uh, private sector at the moment with some of those listed entities, really some some uh, dark clouds hanging over some of those listed entities given the governance failure. So very topical uh, and very important for us to, to spend proper time in terms of analyzing the issue, but then also focusing on what are those opportunities and how can we address the risk. Um, so I just extracted, as I've mentioned, um, a few elements from the report. We're really talking about risk number two, um, which is really talking about those governance failures. Unfortunately, in both the private and public sectors and our private sector failures, as you're all aware, Steinoff, et cetera, being very visible, very publicly noticed, uh, EOH being one of them as well. Um, and I think just sharing a bit of a success story, just wonderful to see how their new CEO, Stephen van Pollard, has just come in there and spent a huge amount of time on corporate culture, uh, on the way we do things, the smell of the place, just to make sure that he roots out that whole uh, 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 root cause of what potentially has led to the failure. So um, just on that sort of positive note, I think really just uh, double clicking a bit and saying, what does it mean when we say there's private and public governance failures? And it really is just saying that what, the, what those entities were employed to do, what they've been set up to do, their specific objectives they were set to achieve, they failed in, in delivering on. Um, and unfortunately, we've got some real examples in the COVID-19 pandemic as well, where some of that uh, personal protective equipment did not reach those very vulnerable individuals that needed that. Um, and there was some corru corruption example in those cases as well. Um, and then just showing you essentially what we built into the, the IRMSA risk report was showing if we don't address this risk, we are essentially sitting in the scenario of a perpetual hangover in South Africa, which is really not where we want to be. We want to take it to owning our future. And so the critical call to action is here, yeah, how do we partner in the private and public sectors and how do we leverage off those positive examples? I've mentioned now the EOH one. There's another beautiful example in Malawi where they've really focused um, and the president has focused heavily on making sure there's some success uh, elements and there's some focus on governance so that they can transform their country and they can root out some of those issues. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, it really at the core of all of this is leadership. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about leadership later. Um, but just to highlight a few elements from the report, I think there are uh, a couple of issues. And if you just look at some of the top five challenges, it really is consequence management. I mean, the reality is leaders have put, been put in, in very responsible positions, custodian positions, and there just has to be consequence management when that um, role was abused and potentially that didn't deliver on the objectives. Um, so making sure that you've got the right directors, making sure that there's law enforcement, making sure that your directors have the right knowledge, um, partnering with institutions like IRMSA or institution uh, of directors of South Africa and others, and leveraging tools in this space. I mean, there's a huge amount of tools, data, as well as technology that can support you in terms of making sure that you have firstly visibility of all of your governance elements in your organization, and then secondly, making sure you're pulling governance together with your strategy and your risk management and all three of those disciplines of swimming in the same direction, making sure you follow a proper combined assurance approach and that it's not just a tick box exercise when you're talking about governance, but you really are talking about the value add to the business. There's some great um, useful data one can extract to inform your decision making so that you have more quality decisions that you make. And how do you do that through data and technology? And are you leveraging that in your environment? Um, I think one of the other things which is very contentious, so um, as was mentioned earlier, I chair the Governance Risk and, and Audit Committee of the CFA Society South Africa chapter. Um, and just talking about director performance and director evaluation, even if you're sitting on an NPO board or you're sitting on an NGO board, 
Um, and and it, it might be something that, you, that you're obviously doing in your own free time. Um, you're doing it pro bono. You're not being paid for that director position. You still have that uh, responsibility and making sure that you do those uh, director evaluations and that there's regular rotation of directors and that you don't have uh, sort of latency in the board and, and too long terms and complacency um, becoming an issue. And then um, I think just this was really insightful for me um, was a, a Harvard, Harvard Law School forum report on corporate governance, which really spoke about those global governance trends at the moment. And, and number one being that there's more focus on the environment and the societal issue at this stage when we talk about ESG, the whole sustainability um, focus globally. There's a big trend to focus on sustainability, um, being inclusive, um, making sure that your impact as, an, as a, a company, as a, um, a public sector entity is for the greater good of society, but also has, does not have a negative and potentially has a positive impact on the environment. And I think the reason for that is just historically, there has been a material amount of focus on corporate governance. Um, and so there's been a lack of focus on environmental and social issues. So, so I don't think that that's a, a major issue, but I think what's important for us to, to just make sure, and it's definitely a trend in South Africa as well that we've observed, is a lot of our corporates uh, and public sector are really focusing a lot more on, well, what's the climate change impact? And what are the social inequalities? We mentioned that a little bit earlier but let's not forget about governance. So those are three pillars that essentially stand together uh, in their own right and, and have to be um, working in, in parallel. Um, and then the thing that I really enjoyed, and, and just to bring that example again of EOH and, and Stephen van Koller, he really just focused on corporate purpose. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping many of you are familiar with the, um, uh, the, the term that's often used of triple, triple bottom line, focusing on people, planet, and profit. Um, and he was actually saying, let's throw the profit out of the door. Let's replace it with purpose because your profit will follow as, as, as long as you're clear about your purpose. Uh, and so any company will be profitable. Any company will be successful if they make sure that they follow the triple bottom line and uh, making sure they focus on their people. The pandemic has highlighted that to us, um, making sure they focus on their purpose um, and then definitely don't forget about the planet because we only have one. Um, and then the third one was really focusing on culture, which I found exceptionally interesting as well. And I've, and I've noticed a lot of organizations have really emphasized and done additional sort of employee engagement surveys, especially during the pandemic, um, and then doing it after post their pandemic response plan to see, have we really listened to our people? Have we understood where they're coming from? Because culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think if you're not very clear about your strategy um, and what can hold your strategy back from being delivered, um, you're essentially not doing yourself justice if you don't do a culture assessment. Um, and then making sure you've got the right level of diversity at the board. Um, really important to also bring in the racial diversity. And I think if I just look at my global peers that I deal with, um, the reality is I think South Africa's leaps and bounds ahead of, of others globally because we've really focused on transformation. I see a lot more female leaders in South Africa. I see a lot more inclusive, inclusivity from different racial groups. Um, it's very easy for me to have a meeting with clients in the US or in the UK um, or in, in any other European country or, or even in the Asian markets, and I'm the only female in the room, uh, and the rest are potentially majority white males. So I really do think we've done well there, and it's important for us to continue with that agenda and push for, for diversity at the board level, making sure we don't get complacent and those historical board members remain on forever. We need to build the pipeline there as well. Um, and then the risk of activism coming through as um, shareholders really becoming a lot more vocal. Um, and then I think overall, maybe not as negative, I think South Africa being ranked as six globally in terms of overall governance um, is really exceptional for um, an emerging market uh, of our nature. I mean, we do have this dual economy. We've got first world, especially in the financial markets. And when we look at data and technology, but the reality is we do have third world country challenges. Um, and so bringing those two together, um, really, we should be proud in terms of what we have achieved. Um, I'm just reminded of the example of Brazil a, a number of years ago. Um, there was a huge amount of focus on the corporate governance failures uh, and uh, public governance failures, but just general uh, governance failures in Brazil. Huge amount of focus on corruption. And there was this perception created globally that Brazil has now become more corrupt. But the reality is they, have, they were always historically corrupt. The only reason why it was now more visible was because there was actual action taken. 
people were held to task. Um, and so interesting enough, the global perception increased, but the actual corruption happening on the ground in Brazil reduced. And I'm really hoping South Africa will follow a similar story. And, and I believe we will definitely, and, and we're heading in that way. Um, I've extracted a bit more stats from the report and you can have a look at the presentation. I'm, I'm sure it will be shared with you afterwards. Um, I think just the one thing to emphasize again uh, that I've mentioned a little bit earlier is really governance at the core of it, there are three elements. You really have to make sure you identify your risks, that you set your strategy and that your CEO is held accountable for making sure that all those risks are mitigated and the strategy is delivered on. Because together, those things essentially make sure that you deliver on the performance of your, of your entity. And that is, in a nutshell, your governance structure. Um, and then I've just extracted four sort of key uh, areas of failure that we really need to just be aware of and make sure that we, that we proactively and consciously avoid, um, which is really, I've spoken a little bit about this already in terms of diversity, um, that we need to make sure the focus is in the right place, that directors understand their role and that the CEO doesn't direct the governing body. We've had some very strong personalities in our country. And I think that that's part of our beautiful um, history and our vibrant democracy that has created those CEOs. But I think it's important to have a right amount of balance across the room and have uh, voices heard across the table, especially your independent directors. Um, so for me, it's just really double clicking here, true diversity, making sure it's not just um, maybe there's a couple of CAs and there's uh, others that have other qualifications, but making sure you've also got gender diversity, you've also got racial diversity, you've got people with potentially completely different backgrounds, completely different uh, competencies, uh, financial, economic, legal, et cetera. Also generational, intergenerational um, diversity is so critical. And how do you influence that as the risk manager? How do you highlight to your board that you feel that that's not being achieved? Similarly, when your focus is misplaced, if you feel that your board is too operational, how do you escalate those issues? How do you escalate those risks? And making sure that there's a very clear, important link between risk strategy and governance. And if those don't work in tandem, because often it's different directors that lead those portfolios, are they going into different directions? Making sure that you highlight that as a governance risk and compliance specialist. Um, and then the third one, just really making sure that the directors are aware, and this is a very tricky one, because often the directors um, sort of bear at the back of their mind the concept that they've been appointed by the shareholders. But the reality is they always have the fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of the company, not the shareholder, which might actually in the short term not be profitable for the, for the, for the shareholder, might not reap dividends, et cetera. But in the long run, we'll ensure we've got a highly sustainable um, company. Especially now with COVID, we've seen some companies are reducing the amount of cost spend on compliance, risk governance, et cetera, because it's really seen uh, as not necessarily value adding. And that is a huge fallacy. And I think it's our role as governance, risk and compliance specialists to bring that value to the fore, to explain and, and give those case examples of how we've added value, not just by ma managing risk, but also actually helping to deliver up to the bottom line. Um, and then the last one was really the CEOs um, not having such a very strong personality. I mean, we've certainly seen that with Steinoff. Uh, and just making sure that, that you, as a, again, a governance risk and compliance specialist, highlight that to, to the board uh, and escalate those uh, matters. So um, just a couple of last thoughts on this specific risk. Um, I think just to talk about what are those solutions and what can we do, make sure and insist that there are independent evaluations done, make sure that there's a director rotation strategy in place, and make sure that there's interpersonal dynamics being assessed. I don't often see that where you do that, you know, you've got the Enneagram profile um, and you've got lots of other personality profiles, Myers-Briggs, et cetera, that you can do. Has those, have those been done in a breakaway with the board or with the exec? And do we understand the different personalities, et cetera? And do we appreciate potentially the A-type CEO that could unduly influence, et cetera? And how do you leverage your tools and data to make sure that you achieve those? Um, and then the last one was just really, I've said it a bit earlier, but I just want to highlight it again, making sure compliance is not a tick box exercise, but that you really, as a governance risk and compliance specialist, focus on the value that you're adding, giving those examples of how you've added value um, and using some examples of globally of how companies have been turned around because of good governance. Um, and then I just wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, on the scarcity of unified ethical and visionary leadership um, I do think that it is a challenge, although 
I personally do think there are some wonderful leaders in South Africa. We've got some exceptional individuals, exceptionally talented individuals. And for me, it really is in our camp to step up into that vacuum of, of leadership, to make sure that you put up your hand, you say, I'm available. I want to be part of the future generation of South Africa. Um, I want to be seen as a, as a board member. I want to be given that opportunity. There's a beautiful program that's being run by the 30% Club, um, which is a director a, education type program um, in, in partnership with SAFCA and Institute of Directors of South Africa, et cetera. Um, Business Engage runs this program and they're really focusing on building more female leadership and specifically building in for more female leadership from a broader racial perspective. So making sure we've got more diversity around the table. Um, and so those types of programs are, are the types of things we should be supporting to, to really get to the solution mode now. So I don't wanna focus on the negative. I think we're all clear on what the risk we're talking about here. Um, there's a, a lack of being very clear, being purpose fo uh, focused, being clear about what impact you want to make on the broader society, that you're not just profit driven. Um, and we've certainly seen, or, or certainly that you're not just self-interest driven. We've seen Turi Madam Sela being a great success story in this space, as well as uh, Sia Kolisi and others. Um, so I think it's it's just, those are the types of examples that we can leverage and we can use and we can share inside of our organizations and make sure that we build on the positive stories. Um, just talking a little bit about the negative, certainly we do have some challenges in terms of the leadership pipeline. And for me, that's where we bring in those leadership development programs. We have limited prosecution. It's a real challenge. And really holding leadership accountable is at the core of this. And more public prosecutions will certainly put us in a greater state. But I do want to just remind us of the Brazil story, where when they did more public prosecutions, there was the perception that Brazil suddenly was more corrupt. But the reality is their level of corruption reduced materially because they were actually bringing people to task. Um, and so globally, it might have been a perception, but locally in Brazil, they've really done a turnaround. And then I think whistleblowing um, policies are just so critical. We've seen um, Cynthia Stimple, a great example of recently uh, being, being a whistleblower and not being protected sufficiently in South Africa. Um, she was the treasurer at SAA. Um, and so for me, it's just using those examples, sharing those stories, and making sure that we set the right protection mechanisms in place so that we do have um, an, an, a whistleblower's uh, policy and we do have that structure available and you can use and leverage technology and data as well, again, to really uh, achieve that. So um, I wanted to just end off with one uh, comment just from the JSC side, certainly something that's exceptionally important for us. And I think really important for us as a, a public marketplace it's been really challenging. We've, there's been so much pressure put on us to increase and make our listing requirements even more challenging, more difficult. And you can imagine then the local SMEs, local small companies that want to list are really struggling to be able to list on the market because it's become so um, expensive from a compliance perspective for them. So it's really that balancing act, making sure that your listing requirements are still relevant, but also making sure you call to task those that have actually um, had some corporate failures and those public censures and fines that we've issued, uh, we believe are very important and will continue in that regard. Um, and there certainly are other examples of how, of how one can call to task um, where you're seeing this happening in practice. Um, so last slide was just giving you the link to the IRMSA risk report. Um, as was mentioned, really insightful, lots of great um, content in there. I've just included in here a couple of links to two interviews. I had a a discussion with Dr. Suresh Khanna, who is the chairman of the King Committee, uh, and, and he's an independent director and board member on various other both public and private sector entities. And we had a discussion on governance and I think really useful insights from him. Uh, and then also a, a discussion I had with Basani Maluleka, who was the previous CEO of African Bank, just about leadership and that vacuum of leadership um, and the challenges that we've faced with. Um, and how she proposes we address those. And I think that'll be really useful as well. So um, I hope it's been insightful and I'm sure this presentation will be shared with you. Um, and I will just, um, I think, end here if there are any questions uh, and I'll hand back to um, Melanie who is chairing. So let me just um, end sharing my screen. Thank you, Nicola. Um, what an awesome presentation and Wow, sweet to the point, but so insightful. Thank you so, so much. Um, I really, for me, there was two points personally that um, stood out. And it was where you spoke about 
you know, the directors um, of the board and um, that they believe they have a fiduciary um, responsibility to act in the best interest of the shareholder, but that's not always, that shouldn't be the case always, it should be for the company and therefore these investments around risk and compliance and what you need to do from a governance perspective won't always show a profit number um, or a revenue increase, but it definitely will show sustainability. And I think wow. that is what you are imploring us to do as executives and directors of companies is to show them the, the, the benefits so that they can make those decisions um, easily and don't feel anxious about not making the profit numbers for the shareholders. I think that stood out for me and maybe it's because I was a company secretary that I hooked on to what you were saying, but that that certainly is a point we all, where we are situated in our boards to remember, it's in the company's best interest and it speaks to your triple line uh, uh, um, uh, element that you brought in, mm. not just about profit because profit will come if you look after people, planet and have a purpose. What also stood out for me is the focus, you know, that we must have focus and we must be um, clear that those governing bodies don't take us away from those focus points or the plan that we've put together with the CEO of the organization. So thank you. Those are the two that stood out for me. And um, so I have a few questions for you, Nicola, on the, the top three risks in the report related to issues of leadership, governance failures and corruption. And I would say these are very closely linked, as you had showed us. Um, as LexisNexis, we view the common denominator of these top three risks as being about inadequate rule of law, which is really our North Star as a legal technology business. How do you believe we as organizations can strive to ensure accountability and consequence management so that the rule of law and compliance are upheld? Sure. So I think um, it, it's it's a it's a heavy burden I think for all of us to to have to carry. But I think if we take the the elephant and we break it up into smaller pieces and make it more practical, um, it's just making sure that we've at least got all those building blocks in place and where we can see there's obvious gaps. So as an example, we might have a very strong um, uh, governance function, but our compliance function is sort of there's one individual there at the back office and it's not not much happening in that regard. And the risk function, because as I mentioned earlier, it's often different individuals that lead those um, disciplines. And if you don't consciously make sure that you understand what impact are they all making, what value are they all adding, and different personalities potentially bring different dynamics to the table, and making sure you understand those dynamics and are the are those all together the little puzzle pieces coming together to actually make an impact and if it's not and and that's for me one of the root causes and issues here it's all about people um, and if we don't focus on um, the individuals that are actually responsible and are the custodians for those different roles and are they influential enough are they able to be unpopular do they have if we, when we do these uh, we, we actually recently had an exco breakaway and we did these um, uh, by Myers-Briggs assessments and we all look at our different personality styles, you have extroverts and you have introverts. I mean, that's, that's just natural. You'll have different personalities around the table. You have very analytical individuals and then you have people that literally just go with their gut. And for me, none of those are wrong or right. The only important thing for us is to make sure that we've got a balance and we've got diversity. So firstly, you've got to be aware of that. So are you doing the analysis? Are you getting the data so that you understand what the dynamics are around the table? And then secondly, are you actively having a conversation around that to make sure that you don't have this power imbalance? I mean, we've seen those examples with, with and I'm obviously very close to the corporate failures, um, with those CEOs that just A-type, extroverts, very uh, gut sense, and ended up not giving enough airtime to those other very valuable uh, directors around the table that potentially were introverted, more analytical, needed a bit more time to digest, wanted to ask certain questions, but weren't given the right opportunity to do that. Um, and making sure you balance all those dynamics around the table. So I think that's the one thing for me. The other thing is making sure that you've got the right tools in place. And I actually have to admit, I'm quite a, a big proponent of making sure you don't over tool yourself. 
because I've also seen that in an organization where they've got a governance tool, they've got a risk tool, they've got a compliance tool, and they've got all these tools, but nothing talks to each other and, and nothing is integrated and there's no holistic and, and um, uh, what do you call it, um, thought through and well-structured approach. Um, and so I think, again, making sure if those disciplines are headed up by different directors that those all feed in together. If you do leverage technology, make sure the technology gives you the business value that you're very clear on what the output is and exactly what you want to monitor and track. Um, and then it's not just, oh, well, the regulator told me I've got to have a system, so now I've got a system and you're not actually leveraging it to the value that it's got. Um, I think data is exceptionally powerful and completely underutilized um, in South Africa and, um, and globally. I mean, we've seen globally a, a massive trend towards more data analytics. Um, and so making sure as a risk compliance and governance specialist, you understand that trend you've got those types of individuals in your team that can actually leverage the data so that you can make informed decisions or at least provide that data in a well-structured way to your decision makers across the group. Um, and if it's not there, highlight that and say that's, that's an area we need to invest in. Thank those are just you. two thoughts. I can probably carry on all day. So let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. Um, I wanted to, I got an expert opinion in the report, Walter Al, Al Ehrlich of Redlaw Fox Associates states, governance fails when the rules, practices and processes that are used to direct and control the organization successfully and sustainably are ineffective or fail. And we know that a number of South African corporate failures have made their headlines over the last few years. How do you believe corporate leaders and risk and compliance professionals can truly harness the value of good governance and not treat it as a tick box compliance issue. And I think you did share some of it with us, but maybe you've got some others that you couldn't do in a short presentation that you could add um, to this one for us, Nicola. Sorry, I'm muted myself. Um, I think just adding off the thoughts of, of leveraging data, leveraging technology, um, and, and as I've mentioned, the people elements are bringing all of those three together. Um, I think the other thing that's really missing is um, really making sure, as I've mentioned, around the sort of whistleblowing protection and those types of structures, there is definitely an opportunity here for us to partner with our legal colleagues and make sure that there's the right structures available around the organization. Um, because interesting enough, there's that Gibbs ethical barometer survey that they do every year and we participate in it. Um, and not all colleagues are always aware of the escalation channels or that they will actually be protected, what their rights are, how they will be protected. I mean, we always unfortunately see the negative news of how all oh, this whistleblower was fired, et cetera, um, and lost their job. And so really making sure that we celebrate the successes and making sure that we've got the right structures and frameworks and, and legal guidance uh, in order to make sure that we have that uh, also to support us. Because the reality is change comes from within and change is uncomfortable. And it starts with having those uncomfortable conversations uh, around the table where potentially you're using your corporate card to take out your clients. At this stage, you're not allowed to take your clients out anymore. You end up taking your family out. You're already you know, blurring the lines. And that's just the start of where it could potentially end very badly. Um, and so I think just talking about those ethical examples where it becomes gray, um, rather tend towards the black and white side of it um, and have frank conversations if you feel, guys, we're overstepping the boundaries now um, because it ends up becoming corporate culture that that's acceptable and then what's the next thing and what's the next thing that ends up happening and building off that um, so having those courageous conversations um, i do encourage uh, that as governance risk and compliance specialists you partner with your hr colleagues and you say what is your whole program we need to roll out across the group um, what are those courageous conversation training elements we need to bring to the table how do we teach people to have that conversation and then as i've mentioned partner with your legal colleagues that you've got a good whistleblowing protection structure in place um, and then I'm not going to reiterate the other points I made earlier, but those are additional thoughts. Thank you, Nicola. It certainly does bode well with me as the sales and marketing person in our organization, uh, because those, uh, I like what you say, the lines get gray, go to the black and white. And my team, being that we are risk and compliance specialists, they certainly keep me on uh, the black and white all the time, which is 
which is a safer one and it keeps us all safe and it keeps me safe as well so that I don't go to jail for some heavy fines as we also saw in the FIC Act and, and so forth. So yes, thank you very much. One, one more. Uh, you've said that the journey of risk professionals playing a role in, in, in issues such as tackling structural inequality and governance failure starts with having the right data points in place. And you've spoken about that during your presentation and in these answers earlier, having the conversation at a strategic and senior levels and having metrics and measurements embedded into the organization's performance culture. What role do you believe technology can play in supporting and empowering us with the information we need to start tackling identified risks. Thanks. Um, I think I'm, I've also just I've listened to your question. I've also just uh, looked at Bosman's uh, comment um, in the chat, and and I think it's really critical to actually take a step back and bring it back to that conversation that we had earlier about triple bottom line purpose um, at the end of the game, but also making sure you think about planet and people. And so what I want to bring in is slightly different dynamic, which isn't always what governance risk and compliance specialists focus on, but it's to say, have you got your sustainability um, figured out as an organization? Have you done your ESG assessment? Have you done your, your analysis of how good you are on the, on the E element, on environmental? Have you checked how well you're doing on the S side, on the societal side? Um, and then G, have you done well on the governance side? Because if you do that as an index and a metric, there's, there are hundreds of, of metrics below that that can help you measure your ESG um, score as an, as an organization. And for me, that's tangible. And I think linking it back to, to Bosman's comment, to me, if you don't have a good ESG score, you will not be profitable because shareholders are no longer looking at companies that are just maximizing profits. Globally, there's a move towards investing in more sustainable organizations. The ESG products are doing exceptionally well. I mean, we've seen more than half the global assets are already moving into ESG funds. So you will not have companies investing in your organization if you don't have that metric clearly quantified and that you've got a target that you're working towards um, and that you're bridging that gap with actionable uh, elements. And for me, that automatically just links in the two elements of, yes, you have to spend on compliance, governance and risk, but it will deliver on returns because you have to make sure you're a sustainable organization. Um, and so I think linking into that, a lot of organizations are now starting to employ a chief sustainability officer. In my mind, that's your CEO. <laughs> so the fact that you've now got a sustainability person is great, but it really is your CEO that that's their core responsibility is making sure that their business is long-term sustainable, but it's good the sustainability officers are now bringing all those metrics in. But I think it's important again for us as risk practitioners, as compliance practitioners, um, governance to partner and make sure these elements don't run in separate streams because you then you're also just doing a tick box exercise and you're defeating the purpose. Um, it's all needs to go in the same direction. It all needs to be tied together with one purpose. And if your CEO doesn't act and bring it all together, that's your root cause where you need to start having the conversation. And I think we're quite lucky at the JSC. I mean, uh, both our, our uh, current CEO as well as our previous CEO were big, big champions on the sustainability front. Uh, and we've really been pioneers in terms of ESG. Uh, but I think that there's a great opportunity for risk practitioners, uh, for compliance and governance to really also familiarize themselves with those metrics, because you'd be very surprised how similar they are to all the other things you're looking for around the organization. So that we don't duplicate effort, especially now that there's this whole ESG trend, don't now go and ask for other elements. Your ethical one is under the governance pillar, I promise you that. It's all in, the, in those metrics and it comes together nicely. True, very true. Thank you so, so much. And with that great answer, it leads me to introduce uh, we're going to share a demo from LexisNexis on a proactive risk management tool. As um, Nicola was explaining to us, it's not just about having the data, but having the right tools. We thought we'll give you an example and, and a quick demo on what is available in LexisNexis and how to help you to use that tool. And over to my esteemed colleague, Aljanet Kleinhans, who is the specialist in this environment. Welcome and thank you. And we're looking forward to the demo alternate. Good, thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I actually wanna start off with Melanie's quote that she used. 
So um, governance fails when the practices and processes that are used to direct and control the organization successfully and sustainably are ineffective or fail. So this actually led perfectly into my tool that I want to show you today very, very quickly. So our proactive risk management tool integrates into your own resources to effectively mitigate against the identified risks and ensure compliance with the law. So this would then also enable the organization to align governance, strategy setting, and risk management. And this allows the conducting of robust, independent evaluations. So what I wanna then also very, very quickly show you, so I've got a few um, tabs that I've got open here at the top to just show you our proactive risk management tool. So firstly with this, this whole tool or this tool helps with visibility. So you've got full visibility on everything. And also as Nicola mentioned that I actually also wanna bring in is this helps so that everything actually goes into the same direction and in the same flow. And this would then also lead and help so that there's no duplication so that you can see where everything is actually identified and pull all of that through. This is also then or will make it easier as discussed in today's webinar to then see and show and so that the CEO can actually also see um, and in more layman's terms how everything is brought together and that you've got proper dashboards to actually show that information. So then very quickly here. So um, I'm just in an example on one of my risk assessments. So this was just a non-compliance to copy. But in here, it just shows you how our tool will help you to identify the risk. Then to do your inherent risk assessment and your residual risk assessment. And also mentioned in today's webinar, this would help with, with um, the framework so that we've got a framework worked into the solution to make it easier to actually identify and go on with your risk assessments. You were then also able to add in all of your controls and from this page you can also then see all my controls that I have in place for a specific risk as well as whether the controls are effective or ineffective and then delve into more details as to why this is and what needs to be done. On this view as well, you can also see all the previous risk assessments and you can actually see how that specific risk has been impacted. So how it went down with all of your controls that you put in place. Then also here, so linking it back to management commitment, leadership and responsibility. Management review um, allows managers to actually go and add in information. So you can actually say why a specific risk assessment might um, not be wrong, but you know, give input on what additional controls there might actually be in place and show that commitment and that um, responsibility in them. Then you can also, with all of that, you can pull a full order trial. So you can also see everything that was actually done on the risk from the moment it was identified, any additional inputs that you might have. And this also brings me back to something that Nicola said, where with different personalities and different people actually working on um, the same goal, you can get that input and see who did what, and uh, when and where. Then pulling all of that together, so bringing everything together, we then have the interactive dashboards where you can drill down into specifics. So you can then see specific areas, specific business units, specific projects, and go into more detail on what is required. So you can filter by specific date ranges, as I mentioned, business units, and you can just see your risk nature, your categories and specific areas. The nice part here is you can also export this. So you can put it in board packs, you can put it in presentations. And as was mentioned to what Boswan said in the chat as well, um, it just makes it easier to present something that is easy to see, easy to understand, and to motivate why these types of tools might be necessary and not a necessary evil, <laughs> but um, yeah, to just help the organization and to make everything visible. All right, so that is me very, very quick and clear. Um, I know we have, we went time and we've got some Q&A as well. So yes, I want to hand over to Melanie to then possibly do a Q&A. Thank you, Aljanet. 
it certainly has given us some insight into what Nicola was telling us and that there's tools to enable those very, really how to identify our risk, how to mitigate that, how to remain compliant and how, how a dashboard is available as well um, for our different governing bodies. That makes it so much easier for the risk and compliance um, officers as well as the risk community because we all are accountable for risk and compliance in any organization. So thank you, it's Altenet. Pleasure. And that's why I also had to watch my, sorry, Melanie, that's also why I had to watch my time, because if you let me just talk about it, I can go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Altenet. Um, So thank you, everybody. We've got a poll question um, that we would like you to also look at while you are listening to a few more questions that I've got um, prepared as well as um, from the Q&A session is that um, I want Nicola back. Is she back? Let's just get her back. Nicola, we need you back. <laughs> We've got a few more minutes to maybe ask one or two more questions to our esteemed guest today. Nicola, many leaders have failed to hold their positions responsibly and have revealed deep-seated corruption and a lack of ethical and visionary leadership in both the public and private sectors in South Africa. How do you believe COVID-19 has compounded these governance failures by private and public institutions? Sure, um, I'm not sure whether it's compounded the issues. I think it's potentially been um, a catalyst to create more visibility around the issues. Um, because it was such a visible crisis that was being managed. Um, certainly seeing that some of those personal protective equipment going lost and being very visibly and publicly disclosed that already quite well positioned individuals additionally benefited from those uh, and there were contracts, et cetera, in place. And unfortunately, very sad, but I think it did actually just highlight and bring to the four elements that were potentially already um, very much entrenched and was just highlighted by the pandemic. Um, on the other hand, I do think that it's created a great opportunity and catalyst for change. Um, and for me, and I had a conversation with Dr. Zajamin actually about that. Uh, he's quite a well-renowned economist from the econometrics um, in South Africa. And he was talking about, in his mind, COVID-19 was the last straw on the camel's back in terms of not taking any action. And the fact that COVID happened and our country that was already heavily indebted, high unemployment rates, et cetera, had to deal with this crisis, then created um, an urgency to take action by our government uh, leaders to make sure that we actually follow a different approach and that we root out some of the corruption and that we do actually address the root cause of the issue, which is very vast social inequality in South Africa. Um, which it's essentially is one of the biggest reasons why we have some of these issues um, happening. Um, and so, so for me, it, it, there's, a positive, it's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel because now it's helped us take action. It's, it's again linked into my previous discussion on ESG. There's a big focus globally on sustainability and COVID has just given that an extra nudge forward to say, are we focusing on our, enough on our people, on their health? Are we focusing enough on society, the impact it's having on broader society? We're seeing the, the, the big impact now in India um, where they've essentially prioritized creating all of the vaccines, shipping it out, but they haven't looked after their own people locally. So it really has just highlighted the imbalance of commercial focus um, over people focus. And, and I think a great opportunity for leaders with a completely different mindset to step to the fore. Awesome, thank you for that. Um very thought-provoking um, comments there. Nicola, in, in closing, um, what, would, what would be your number one piece of advice for our attendees as we reflect on the urgency of what you have shared with us today? Um, from a leadership perspective, from standing up, for standing out, just leave us with that one piece of advice. I think the key thing that I live and, and will die by um, is that we all have unique talents. Um, and I think each and every one of the individuals that have joined your call know exactly what their special thing is. They know exactly what their unique talent is. And for me, it's make sure you focus on your strengths and 
stop worrying about your weaknesses and the elements you're not you're not well at and make sure that you leverage your strengths to actually achieve your purpose and your objectives um, and so i think invest in yourself make sure that you spend enough time um, to expose and, and give others exposure to your strengths because the only time when you'll be able to make an impact is if you yourself are performing at your your best and and at the top of your game and as risk compliance governance specialists, I'm already assuming you're all ethical and you're all exceptionally well focused on wanting to make a, a, an impact for the greater good of society. And But for me, it's just how do you do that and make sure that you find your inner light and you make sure that that inner light shines as brightly as it can. Um, go to things like courageous conversations, build your, your personal um, uh, confidence levels. I mean, th they have those things where you go and you, and you do um, presentations, sort of stand up presentations, um, Toastmasters clubs, those types of environments, Wh whatever your personal thing is, just make sure that you're brave enough to, to call out the issues that you're not comfortable with. Don't let them slide. Um, we often talk about choose your battles. We're unfortunately not in a position where we can do that. As governance risk and compliance specialists, you have to fight every little fight uh, as politely as you can and as confidently as you can. Absolutely. Thank you. And with that, it is a thank you to Nicola Kamnunos for joining us this morning. Thank you to all the attendees for making this worthwhile this morning. Thank you for the demo, Algenet, for the team that put this together at LexisNexis. Please do answer our poll. And we look forward to the next Governance, Risk and Compliance webinar. And um, thank you and have a beautiful week and let your light shine and be bold and stand up for every battle, not don't choose them um, as a governance risk and compliance committee. Thank you and have a beautiful day. Bye-bye. Bye. Lexus Nexus, are we staying on? I think Greg, uh, most have left, so it's probably not necessary. Um, I'm also still here. <laughs> okay, I see there's still some attendees. Maybe we should just reconvene later. Perfect, thank you. Thank you.